I'm here with Ian McNulty, author of Season and I, Life in New Orleans After Katrina. Did I get that right? Uh, New Orleans Life After Katrina, same difference. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> when did you start on this book, Ian? Uh, well, the, the origins of it go back to really uh, email messages uh, that I was sending back and forth to friends and family who were just wondering what was going on in New Orleans after the uh, CNN cameras turned off for the night. And... Uh, from there, I just realized that what I was doing was documenting this chapter of the city's history as it was unfolding. And uh, as uh, people became more and more interested in, in, the, in the details and the nitty gritty of how the city was very slowly rebuilding itself, I realized I could uh, turn it into actual book manuscript. Now, you, in essence, snuck back into New Orleans. That's right, it was closed yeah. down. Well, you will remember back in that time, there was just really very little official word or guidance on what to do with anything. Nobody was prepared to deal with the consequences of that storm, what happened. And uh, so we were sitting in Baton Rouge just wondering when we could ever get back. Uh, I had uh, discovered that my uh, neighborhood, while it was destroyed, was, uh, my houses are actually still standing, and that the second floor of my house was relatively un unscathed, even though the first floor was a flooded wreck. <laughs> so I decided that I would rather live in the, in the heart of my own neighborhood and uh, contribute to it coming back and, and document it coming back than, than to be stuck in, um, in displacement for God knows how long. So I came, uh, came back as soon as I could and uh, kind of slipped through the, <laughs> slipped through the security, security <laughs> checkpoints and, uh, and that was it. That was the beginning of my, uh, of my, my life in, uh, in, the, in, in really what amounted to a, an urban pioneer frontier area. I mean, there was no services, no electricity, uh, and hardly anybody else around for miles and miles for a long time. And you were writing this on, what, a laptop? How a did laptop. you keep it charged? Well, uh, a lot of people ask me that. I, uh, I really did write most of this by candlelight on my laptop, the first draft anyway. But uh, I was working at a bank. It was the dichotomy of New Orleans at the time, downtown by the river where it didn't really flood. And they didn't have all that much damage. Things looked pretty normal. They had huh. electricity back up real quick. And uh, every day I would go to my, my uh, office at uh, the Hibernia Bank in downtown New Orleans. I would plug in. The first thing I would do is I'd plug in my... Laptop to charge up, my cell phone to charge up, my digital camera to charge up, <laughs> and I would suck all the juice I could out of the bank, do my day's work, and uh, and then uh, I would pedal home on my bicycle, just a two mile trip up through a completely different world uh, that looked like uh, you know some sort of post war scene of just blasted out neighborhoods for miles and miles. But I had my charged up battery, <laughs> my charged up phone, oh. computer, and phone, and I was ready. Now, were there moments in watching New Orleans struggle along? where you thought, oh Lord, this isn't going to work, this is just going to stop. It was very much touch and go day to day, I mean it really was. If, if people ask me now, like, you, you lived in your house for six months without electricity, without hot water? Well, we didn't know it was going to be that way. We didn't know what was going to happen and uh, nobody was charting it out and like I said before, there was no official guidance certainly, but none of us really knew what we were getting into. I just knew that it felt right to be there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it wasn't all uh, it wasn't all uh, d dismal and miserable. If it was, I mean, none of us would have survived it mentally. Uh, there was the joy of being back home, even though it was a destroyed neighborhood and very, very hard times. Um, New Orleans people were back, and we were, the people that were there were determined to make this a city again. And though in the very beginning it was very, very few people, you felt like you were, uh, in a sense, pioneers, rebuilding your city, repopulating your city, and that was a very encouraging way to feel. And uh, that's what I try to get through in my book, that it wasn't just, uh, woe is me, my city's wrecked, the insurance companies, the politicians, all the stuff that people have heard about. I wanted people to see the real reasons why we were back and why we were putting up with the hardships, why we were discovering along the way the things that we really love about the city that kept us there. Uh -huh. Now, what's been the reaction with people around you? I mean, imagine as you were writing this book, many people in New Orleans write books, quote unquote, but I mean, this one became a book. It was published. Yeah. You've been on television about it. Yeah. Uh, how has that changed your engagement with the community? How did they feel about the book when it came out? Well, it, very naturally, when I go to book signings, I mean, some people, is you know, this book came out three years after the storm, so some people were shaking their heads. They're sick of it. I'm sick of it. Katrina, I'm sure you wrote a good book. I don't want to. I don't want to see it right now. Uh, that was some people, and I could totally understand that. If people walk mm -hmm. by my book table with their and sort of shook their heads. I mean, I can really understand that. But I, I didn't really write it for them so much. I wrote it for either people who weren't there, but who, were, who cared about this chapter of, of really American history, this, this part where an entire American city is wrecked and literally emptied of just about all its people, 
and then those people have to elect to come back and trickle in on their own plan at their own pace and uh, with their own risks. Uh, I think that's an extraordinary chapter in American history, no matter how you slice it. So I wanted to tell that story to, to anybody who was interested. But what's been really uh, uplifting for me personally is to see the people who did go through that and uh, were there along with me, but aren't writers. You know, they were doing their own thing. They're taking care of their families. They're taking care of uh, their, in many cases, their extended families. Uh, and they were, were working to rebuild their lives, and they weren't writing things down. But they were living it, and they wished that they had some way to document it. And uh, it was an incredible time for everybody who went through it. So the people that I've heard from who say, thank you for writing this book, this is the way that I felt, even though we had totally different experiences in the particulars, you really nailed the, uh, the theme and the feel of being back there. And when I hear that from people, well, that makes up for a lot. Fantastic. What are you working on now? I'm working on a book that's uh, tentatively titled Louisiana Rambles, uh -huh. and it is a uh, travel narrative around South Louisiana. The um, original idea was just to, uh, to track some day trips out and about in, uh, in driving distance, three-hour driving distance from New Orleans, and to get out into the, uh, you know, the Louisiana part of Louisiana, which we know is quite different from the New Orleans part. Uh -huh. And that's, um, that's been wonderful. I've been uh, learning a lot along the way, and, and it's really taking shape as a, a travel narrative that will explain uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of different places that visitors see, some of the backstories, some of the personalities. You can use it as a travel guide, but you can also read it and just get a sense of the culture of the state. Do you feel like you're, you're writing in these two books? I mean, at the end of, of Season of Night, you've got that almost hopeful celebration of, you know, wow, first Mardi Gras. Do you feel like this arc in what you're working on? And like, hey, man, now I'm really celebrating. <laughs> well, yes, it's true. It, it, it's, uh, Louisiana is, uh, it's, it's partied atmosphere. It is well-deserved, even though the stereotypes aren't quite true. People here have a great time. They really do. Everywhere you go, people are having a good time. The, the festivals are fantastic, but it, it's really like the, the family cohesion and the amount of traditions that people have that can be passed down, that have this cultural meaning. This stuff is not made up. It's very real. You can feel the genuine uh, joy that people take in living here and uh, the ways that make it different. And there's a lot of people who aren't actively preserving this stuff. They just live in their lives. And for the traveler, it's like going to a different country. So it's been a lot of fun. And I'm also glad I'm doing it right now because, you know, frankly, Louisiana is, is up against really hard times with the, with the coastal erosion crisis. Parts of the state are literally disappearing. So the part, some of the parts of the state that I'm visiting may not be around in 10 years if nothing changes. So while this isn't a political call to arms type of book, I hope people will read it and, uh, and understand that there's something really unique and special here. But it's also fragile and needs some protection. Well, thanks so much, man. Thanks this was time. great. Okay.